As well as being the oldest and most prestigious trophy in sailing, the America's Cup is also the hardest to win. In 172 years, the Cup has been competed for 36 times. America has only lost seven times, and only three countries other than the USA have taken the trophy home. So, whether it's afloat or ashore, teams or technology, it's universally accepted that to stand any chance of success, you need to be prepared to compete at the absolute max on every level. Yet, for all the effort that goes into winning the ornate silver trophy, the bottom line is that it is the fastest boat that wins the America's Cup. It's as simple as that. It sounds obvious, and yet creating the fastest boat is anything but. The opening event in Spain saw the AC-40s racing for the first time. Even in light wind conditions, they're clearly very quick boats. But they're not the boats that will be used come the America's Cup itself in 2024. So how do the AC-40s fit into the Cup programme? For many of the teams, this Cup cycle involves three very different machines. A test boat that's sometimes referred to as an LEQ-12, an AC-40, and the big beast itself, the AC-75. So what are they? Why are they required? And what roles do they play in the team's journey along the road to the America's Cup? The easiest way to understand the various types of boats is to work backwards. The America's Cup match in October 2024 between whoever the successful challenger is and the defenders, Emirates Team New Zealand, will take place in custom-built 75-foot foiling monohulls, the AC-75s. This was the class of boat that was used in the last America's Cup in Auckland in 2021. The AC-75s will also be used before the Cup match to select the challenger that will go forward to race the defender. For this America's Cup cycle, teams are only allowed to build one AC-75. Last time, they could build two. The class rules set out the key dimensions, such as length, weight, sail area, foil size, crew numbers and so on. Teams then work to this to create their own custom design. But the rules are also very detailed and complex when it comes to the specific engineering and operational details. There used to be a time when sailors could read and understand a fair bit of the detail of the rules. Today, well, unless you're a rocket scientist or a Formula One engineer, forget it. An AC-75 is a very complex machine. So with teams only allowed to build one AC-75, the development work has been taking place on a smaller version. Under the rules, this has to be less than 12 metres long, hence the name LEQ-12, meaning less or equal to 12. Some teams, like Ineos Britannia and Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli, went full on with their LEQ-12 designs and have spent a great deal of time testing and tweaking, and in some cases, rebuilding. Other teams have decided to use a different boat for their testing, the AC-40. This is also a 12 meter foiling monohull, but unlike the custom LEQ-12s and the AC-75s, the AC-40 is a one design, meaning they're all identical. Under the rules, every team, including the defender, has to have at least one AC-40, and they have to race them in the two preliminary events ahead of the Challenger Selection Series, the first of which was in Villanova in Spain. The Youth America's Cup and the Puech Women's America's Cup events will also be run in the AC-40s. Some teams have chosen to buy a second AC-40 and use it as their test platform. American Magic, Alinghi Red Bull Racing and the Kiwis have gone down this route. Given that when the boats are at speed, it's only the foils that are in the water, you could argue that the hull doesn't matter as much if you're looking at foil development and control systems. 
but there's a limit to what you can do in modifying an AC40. Building a custom LEQ12 allows a great deal more flexibility when it comes to looking at systems. The downside is that it's more time consuming and likely to be far more expensive too. There's also the risk that you can end up heading off in radical time consuming directions in search of a technical gain and end up in a design cul-de-sac. On the face of it, the AC40 is a simple boat. It has just four crew, two drivers, one on each side, a flight controller and a sail trimmer. Unlike the AC75 in which the power to operate the hydraulic rams comes mainly from the physical input of the crew, on the AC40, the sail and foil control systems are all electrically operated hydraulic controls. The AC40 also has an autopilot style flight control system that helps the crew achieve smooth flight on the foils. So what's an AC40 like when you're in it? I caught up with Emirates Team New Zealand's coach and former crew member Ray Davies at their base in New Zealand, who sat me in the boat to talk me through the controls. The first thing that strikes me, Ray, is this, it's 40 foot, but it doesn't feel it when you come aboard, does it? It feels no. more like a 30 foot. No, no, it feels a lot smaller. No, you're right there. Is that because it's, and it is quite narrow, isn't it, I suppose, compared to a conventional boat? Yeah, I guess you're not really seeing um, a lot of the boat too, certainly when you're in here. It feels a lot bigger when the you know, rig and everything's in, but no, I think you're right, it does, it's deceptively um, a small feeling. Well, it certainly does from the helm position here because I'm halfway forward in the boat for a start. <laughs> well, I'm quite close that's to where the true. mast is. I mean, the mast is just over there. We're almost midships, aren't we, up here? Yeah, there's a lot of boat behind you for sure. Yeah. And part of the thinking on that was just so that the helmsman would have you know, as good a visibility as possible not trying to look past anyone and uh, again when you're on the leeward side you, you can look at sail shapes and you know off, off to the side to leeward downwind that's where all the wind is so you're sort of the tactician downwind so you're looking at ley lines and bottom marks and so forth and it's just a nice yeah cozy setup with the with the the trimmer can also see how much uh, the, the helmsman's got on with his wheels so this is the trimming position and you can see rather that it's almost more important that the trimmer knows what's going on with the helms person than the other way around, otherwise he's blind behind you. So it's really, really nice for the trimmer to see how much rudder angle's being used and if he's feeling comfortable or not. So that's one of the, one of the reasons we've switched it this way. Interesting. And so when you're saying trimming, just remind us what they're trimming everything, they're trimming the foils, the trimming... Yeah, so this aft position is when you're on the windward side of the boat, you can do e either the jib or the main. At, at the push of a button, you're selecting either the, the main functions. So you've got traveller and main sheet, and then Cunningham and outhaul, mass rotation. So you're doing that from the windward side. So you're basically in control of the heel of the boat, which is absolutely critical. There's an, an autopilot flying the boat above the water, so that the trimmer is just really, really trying to keep the, the mast vertical, basically, with pretty much it you know, a, a flat zero heel. And the functions are there and he's watching the helmsman. He can look over the other shoulder and see what gusts of wind are coming. Now, when he's on the leeward side, he can be doing, looking at the jib and he's doing the jib functions. The, the push of a button, those same eight buttons then go into to jib functions, cunning him, you know, jib track, in and out, sheet. So it's, uh, yeah, it's try to keep it there to standard off the shelf components and kept it as simple as we can, but uh, it works really well. And I see, I mean, for instruments, it's um, fascinating. You've got, they're basically two Galaxy phones here. Yeah, they are. No, they're, they're Samsung Galaxy phones. And they're, um, we've made some custom mounts for them, but behind them is a, a wireless charger. Okay. So they're always, you don't have any battery issues. You I wonder why there weren't any wires there. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so they're obviously waterproof and then a nice little compact display, which can be customized they're in the one design configuration there at the moment so it's got your basic boat speed true wind angle the heel of the true boat angle. oh yeah heel there yeah yeah you've got a traveler position because you don't see that bar oh, graph at the top one, yeah. is actually the traveler so you'd see where that is the the trim of the boat the, the middle button the middle display oh, yeah. there yeah um and then you've got the, the angle of the cant the cant angle of the foil on the oh, port yeah, side good, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and then and the windward the... side that would have it up in the air. So around that 60 is your sort of sailing number. And this helming position, the beauty is the person on the other side can do a lot of the setup for you. Right. It's exactly the same as mirrored, so you could only be worried about driving and pointing the boat and looking at your true wind angle. And then the other helmsman can be doing the ride height, the cant, and, and, and your, your, your settings for you. And you're saying that's why you didn't want the controls on the wheel, or just because yeah, it was we wanted, complex as well? One of the to... reasons is, let's just keep it super simple, so anyone who hops in here can have a pro on the other side doing all your functions for you. And then it's not intimidating feeling like you have to do things at the same side. So anyone new to the boat, you're literally just holding a wheel and steering and not having to do anything else. But at the touch of a button just off the edge of the wheel, you can, you can make your own adjustments as well. So for example, you've got your uh, height button, that's the, you're adjusting the autopilot yeah. to fly the boat a bit higher. Uh, okay. So if you're feeling that the conditions are nice and you're looking up the track, there's a nice flat water, you can go, well, let's jack the height up a little bit more. Right, um, so the, you just be putting yeah. it there. And then on this side, for example, the trim is the bow down or up, okay. so you can go bow up, bow down, and then the board up, board down. So okay. if you're going into a tack, you'd, be, you'd say, okay, stand by tack, dropping the board, three, two, one, push, done. Yeah. Yep, that's what you have to do, hit that, the board will go down to its setting. Once it's down and in the water, you go, okay, that should have attached it's the flow. You turn into the tack and you're done. Then you let go, you're on the leeward side now. Mm. So now you're on the leeward side and you're gonna tack back the other way. So the other guy's so board going down, he, he'll drop the board for you. Now you've turned through head to wind, you take over control and then go board up. Okay, yeah. And now your board will come up. So you're just doing your board up and down right and only worrying about that well, what's the maximum difference you know, on the wheel are you, we talking about from there to there yeah. or is, yeah. yeah so you're really only yeah yeah exactly kind of, right and the wheels shape that way so, so you can see your displays through the wheel right and, and not having it impinge on your view yeah but the ac40 is also an unusual boat for a cup cycle it's not often that one designs feature in the america's cup and even less often that a design has a life outside the America's Cup. Never before a boat that was made for the Cup has been made available for the outside public with the intention of running uh, races uh, and to form a class. We can, we can certainly say that we, we have seen foiling taking over a large number of major events as an industry. Um, it's growing double digits every year. We'll hear more from foiling expert Luca in the next episode. Plus, we'll also hear more from Ray Davies about how to sail an AC40, as well as why this boat could have a future beyond the America's Cup. In the meantime, as the clock counts down, teams have plenty on their plates as they try to juggle the demands of performing on the race course while working on creating their ultimate design. As always, striking the right balance is the key, but that's the difficult bit, because all the teams know that history suggests that it's the fastest boat that wins the America's Cup. The trick is figuring out what makes fast. A sustainable future, Yamar.